I've always been afraid of stratified structure in the firm. But the reality is, is that you literally can't have 22 people or 21 people coming to you. Business of Architecture, episode 299. Hello, Architect Nation. I'm Enoch Sears, and this is the show where we explore the intersection between design and enterprise, otherwise known as the business of architecture. Today, I welcome Wade Weissman to the show. Weissman is an accomplished architect, founder, and principal of Wade Weissman Architecture. They have offices in Milwaukee, Nashville, Chicago, Pittsburgh, and Santa Barbara, with a staff right now of about 35. Wade is rapidly expanding staff and offices around the country, and they recently released their first monograph, Heirloom Houses, which highlights their residential work. Now, before we jump into today's episode, let me tell you about a resource for podcast listeners. If you'd like a roadmap to growing a self-managed firm, get free instant access to the four-part architecture firm profit map video by going to freearchitectgift.com. Enter your best email address on that page and you'll get instant access. You'll also get access to my weekly tips on growing your dream practice. And with that, let's get on with today's show and our conversation with Wade Weissman. Hello, Wade, and welcome to the Business of Architecture. Thank you very much for having me uh, on your show today. Absolutely. Well, let's just start out, let our audience know kind of the background. I'd love to hear the story about how you initially started your firm, Wade? Uh, just really needing uh, to make money and, and, and find a way to utilize my education. Um, I, uh, I started my firm uh, basically like I think a lot of people do, which is uh, doing favors for friends or family that turn into nice little design opportunities. Uh, and so when I was out of graduate school and working for different firms during my internship years, I always seemed to have some little side projects going on for a neighbor's porch or a relative's new garage or something like that. Uh, and I always wanted to apply myself to seeing whatever that opportunity was, no matter how utilitarian it was, uh, was something that was going to be a real enhancement to the client and their life. And so little by little, those projects grew. And uh, for the first few years, I would get these little porch projects. And so I called it the Porch of the Month Club firm. And uh, that was kind of how it started until somebody actually gave me a commission to do a more substantial addition to a residence. So the firm kind of started out growing out of uh, basically, you know, doing service favors for people. Sure. And the the time when you got that larger commission, that whole house project, was that when you were still employed or had you already split off and started your own thing at that point? You know, I, I had um, started off uh, when I came, came out of graduate school. I was working for a general contractor, helping them with, with, with doing floor plans for a design, small design build shop. And the reason I took that position was my my brother had purchased a piece of property and was interested in building a lake home. So I was doing that lake home project uh, while I was working for this general contractor. And after the house got built, a few years later, when I was doing these little porch of the month club projects, I ended up getting a phone call from an attorney that bought the piece of property adjacent to my brother's property and said he just loved the house and was interested if I would talk to him about designing a house for him. And it was that commission that actually initiated my standalone firm because I left the firm I was working for and worked full-time for myself after that moment. Got it. And looking back to that early days when you had that initial commission, talk to me about any, did you have any worries or fears about where the next project was going to come from after that one was done? You know what? That's that's a realization that you get to as you're getting closer to the completion of the project. But when you have the pro the project, you're so excited that you've got this first opportunity that you just kind of focus on trying to make that a really great piece of architecture. And so the reality doesn't really set in that. Wow, how do you actually work, do, and market at the same time when you're working as a single proprietor? 
Um, so yeah, it was a great question. It, it, did, it did, it actually came up, but I was very fortunate in that um, I had made some contacts along the way with the team that I was working with on the project that actually started referring me some additional clients. And so I started getting a little bit of a backlog of projects that were coming in from referrals from the, the contractor and the other providers of services that were, you know, engaged in the project that we were working on initially. So it was really, a, a, that I found that to be a really great way of marketing my business, actually. Great. And was there any active marketing or business development that you did at that time? Or was this just passive, just doing good work and, and keeping in touch with these people? How, what did that look like? Well, there's always a social component to your life. Um, my life in particular, um, I, I, I do like to entertain and um, uh, spend a lot of time, you know, just essentially trying to build relationships with the people around me. So what you do as you're working on projects is you start to build relationships with people. And, and then I usually add a social component. So I'll say, hey, I'm going to have a barbecue over the weekend. I'd love for you and your wife and kids to come over and, and, and join us. And so what happens is, is you begin to share your uh, abilities to start to entertain and to share how you want to live. And really, you know, our business about design and architecture is, 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 is also includes a lot of lifestyle and, and it's a lifestyle uh, branding that I really um, uh, aspire to and feel like you have to kind of live and practice what you preach. So those opportunities were opportunities for me to showcase that, you know, this is, uh, this is more than just, you know, here I am a good practitioner but I actually, you know, practice what I preach. Got it. Now, how did you grow from being the sole practitioner to, let's say, a team of two or three? Tell me, walk me through that. So I was fortunate in meeting a young group of builders um, in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, um, while I was working on my, my individual commissions. <clears throat> and they started hiring me freelance for design vision for their clientele. And as I, as I began to win commissions for them and, and elevate, you know, the, the opportunities for them, like somebody would come in and say, I want to do, you know, a sitting room edition. And then, you know, I end up giving them a vision for the whole house. And so they would get, you know, this significant commission out of it. So they started feeding me a lot of work and realized that I was having a hard time, you know, keeping up and trying to get some sleep at night. So um, they actually reached out to me and said, Hey, can we, can we um, partner with you to, um, you know, start uh, a, a more design sort of focused uh, office uh, and, and then we would maybe be able to, you know, help you acquire some people that we know in the business. And so uh, their relationships with uh, other people in the industry allowed me to be able to expand my workforce. And so I was able to bring on um, a intern that was at the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee, and um, and a, a young man who was also, um, you know, kind of a, he helped detail interior designers' drawings. And so uh, he came on as my first employee. And so I ended up having a little tiny practice of three that grew kind of very quickly. Got it. So with this, okay, so you started out with this small team of three. And then walk me through kind of what time period are we here? Walk me, first of all, kind of how many years this took to get to that three person stage and then walk me through the next jump up in the evolution of the firm. Sure. So, uh, I was working for this contractor to, is, as an independent architect, uh, in the years 97 through 99. And in 99, when they asked me to, to, you know, they were bringing me, you know, a significant amount of work and knew that it was going to be difficult for me to sort of handle it on my own. And so, um, in 99, uh, I actually opened or started moved my practice into the back room of their office. And that gave me a facility big enough to be able to 
then hire a couple of people. And so, you know, they had the infrastructure of like a computer system and things like that, that I did not have at the time that allowed me to be able to acquire these two individuals in 99. And it's very interesting between 99 and 2001, I think we grew by another three people. And so, um, in fact, I found an old calendar the other day from um, 2001 uh, and I was going through, you know, the, the calendar of, of the different projects that I was working on at the time. And it was very, very interesting because I remember distinctively, um, uh, you know, how many individuals, uh, you know, we, we sort of brought on. And so I brought on two draftspeople and an interiors person during that period of time. And so we had a force of six Um uh, we, so we doubled from three to six in, in, uh, in the years 2000 and 2001. Got it. And talk to me about some of the challenges in that period of growing from uh, the, the two or three people up to the six. Well, um, uh, you know, at the time I was still doing a lot of the design work and doing the interior and exterior architectural styling. So I remember between, um, well, let's just say uh, uh, up until, um, so we grew from those six people in 2001 to, te- to 22 people in 2007 um, and, um, and, and had brought on some, uh, you know, much more sort of experienced people at that time that were able to handle the job site, you know, uh, construction administration, um, and then there was also a couple of really good, strong design oriented people that we brought in as well. And we started getting some opportunities and commissions in other states. So we had a really interesting opportunity that came up in Carmel, California for a Chicago client that we worked for. And then we uh, got a referral for a couple of jobs in Aspen, Colorado. And that actually really started growing our firm quite a bit. We started doing these larger mountain residences. Um, and some of the people that I had acquired, you know, had a lot of contacts. And so their contacts became, you know, my contacts, which was really nice. So uh, what happens is, is the individuals that you bring on, and we began really early to try to find and focus on really talented people that were, you know, outside of our local area that had a lot of very high end residential experience so that we weren't just training our own people uh, in our local marketplace for doing custom residential that came out of a commercial realm, but people that actually came out of a residential realm and very, very high end, you know, high end service and high end material finishes that they were very professional in, in coordinating significant, you know, sophisticated sets of drawings and, and, and documents with, with a lot of consultants. So that, that was really a, 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 that was a really the sort of impetus for the major push. Um, and at the time, we worked out of one office, um, and we just kept expanding that office. So in uh, 2003, we expanded to a more significant office, and that's during those periods of, you know, two, three, four, and five, and six, and seven. Those years, we were doing a lot of growth. We were doing a lot of hiring, and we started doing some significant commissions. We had gotten a couple of commissions that, you know, the home residences were over 20,000 square feet um, and required a lot of very sophisticated uh, design efforts where we were doing, you know, indoor natatoriums and, you know, working with moisture control systems that were much more sort of sophisticated. You're, you're dealing with a lot of consultants at that point. You are dealing with very sophisticated millwork people, um, uh, stone uh, and trades people that, you know, are, are much more niche oriented rather than um, uh, commodities oriented. Um, so, uh, you know, we, we really began to start establishing, um, you know, our place uh, in, in the market um, as, as a provider of very high end residential work, which is really what we were sort of focusing on. And we really began to start to look m- more significantly at, at, at marketing efforts and hiring really good professional people. So we hired an advertising agency out of Chicago that was um, very good at, at, at helping us do some really good branding. Um, and then 
in 2005, um, uh, I bought out my, my three business partners that were the contractors um, and uh, purchased the firm uh, and, and owned it since then solely. So in 2005, I, I purchased uh, the firm and uh, in five, six and seven is, is the years that, um, you know, I was, you know, paying for the, the building the equity of the firm. Um, and wouldn't you know, just as, as things were, were really bustling along and I finally paid off my partners, the economy changed <laughs> and the recession started in 2008. So, um, you know, then you, you, you know, we went through a, a, a significant, you know, sort of valley, you know, in our, in our, in our practice. Um, uh, but the nice thing is, is there's always a few people that, you know, are in a very uh, good cash position during those economic downturns. And those individual clients were the ones that actually were our saving grace during the recession because they were in a position to continue to work and they found significant value in the construction marketplace and in the commodities marketplace because the recession allowed for them to be able to, you know, find labor for very reasonable rates. Walk me through what it was like when you saw the market start to downturn. How did you cope with that, deal with that? What were the challenges of doing that? Well, you know, first of all, there's the emotional challenge, which is the phone stops ringing. And um, and where you were in demand just a year earlier, you're realizing that you your, your backlog is drying up. Um, or you start getting a deluge of phone calls like I did and people saying, hey, I'm going to put the brakes on the project or, hey, I'm going to mothball the project for now. Um, really kind of skittish on the marketplace, kind of want to see what's going to happen here. Um, and those, those, you know, you try to be very gracious, but each time you get a phone call like that, you realize that, you know, now I'm going to have to, unfortunately, um, lay off some of the individuals that I have in my workforce in order to sustain the firm. Um, and very soon after you get to the point where you, you know, you're, you're starting to cut your own salary and, you know, your own benefits and, you know, some of those kinds of things. And we even got to a point where we had rolling furloughs. Um, uh, and the phone didn't ring as often, but we did, we did get some, some really fantastic clients during that period. Um, that, like I said, we're still able to, you know, move forward with projects. So although, um, you know, we, we, we had to cut our workforce literally from 22 to five. Um, uh, and, 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 and not only was that, uh, there, there, there was some significant, uh, you know, sort of additional hardships that personally I endured during that time. Um, I was in the, in 2007, um, I began construction on a really significant studio space to be able to grow the firm to 30 people. Um, and I designed the space to, uh, occupy part of one half of the building and the other half of the building would have been occupied by a high end interior designer named John Schlagenhoff, who, um, also have to be my first cousin, but we did a lot of work together, uh, in, you know, during the two thousands, um, and um, had a significant amount of commissions that we were working on in 2007. And in 2008, as the economy began to turn, the, he and his partner were unfortunately killed in a plane crash. Um, and so the, 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 you know, here we are, you know, in the midst of construction of this big studio space. Now this firm basically is, um, you know, in question on whether or not it's even going to, you know, even be a, a viable company. Um, and we're in the midst of a construction loan, um, which can't turn into a mortgage because now it's in probate. So it was a, a very, very difficult personal time for me, as well as, you know, the economy, um, you know, turning, um, you know, sort of south. So, um, but, uh, you know, the challenges were that, you know, you, you cut your workforce so that you can create at least enough backlog for whoever's working. Um, and, and, and when we did have work that would come in that allowed us to be able to expand, we would, you know, make some offers back to some of the people that um, we unfortunately had to lay off. And because the downturn was so deep, 
a lot of them, you know, could not find work. And so I was able to reacquire a lot of my same employees that are still with me today that, you know, went through that period with me. Um, but, uh, the, the thing is, is I thought that it would never last as long as it did. Um, it lasted longer. Um, and, and, uh, and so during that time, you know, there is a new normal that begins to establish, you know, people get used to being able to get really inexpensive fees. Um, people get used to being able to, you know, get very competitive, you know, construction pricing. Um, and so when the economy was starting to, tr- you know, sort of reignite a little bit, those clients were finding incredible opportunities in other places in the country. And so those clients were call me and say, Hey, I just bought a piece of property in California. I'd love for you to come and take a look at it. Lo and behold, some of those marketplaces, economies started coming back a lot faster than the local marketplace we had in the Midwest, Midwest being a little bit more traditionally um, conservative. So we ended up getting into these new marketplaces just as the economy was beginning to take off again. And because so many firms had dissolved during that period, we found ourselves in a very unique opportunity because we were an intact firm. We did not, you know, have to, um, uh, you know, go any extreme routes. Um, And our infrastructure was set up for being able to have a lot more people in our office. And so, during that period, we were able to acquire a lot of people back in our office, bring in some new blood for projects that we were working on outside of our local area. That was key because it allowed us to be able to expand, you know, fairly quickly and bring people on. Whereas on the coast, as the marketplace started heating up, those firms were starting to get competitive now for, you know, bringing on employees. Um, so it was kind of a, uh, you know, it was a perfect storm on the demise and during the downturn, but by keeping everything intact, we were also at the perfect, we were in the perfect, you know, place to see, you know, expansion and expansion quickly. Wade, I, I can't imagine or begin to imagine the emotional impact of being there in 2007, uh, shortly after that, as things start to slow down, as uh, your, your, what your future strategic partner and a cousin is killed in a plane crash and and your construction projects put on and and the loan anyways is put into probate i mean it sounds it, it sounds ex- very very difficult i would just like to ask you and see if you could give me some insight on how you dealt with that difficult time just emotionally being able to continue on and and not throw in the towel well you know what um yeah thank you for mentioning that um you know, it was um, it was kind of a blur. Um, you know, first of all, we were best friends. So you lose your best friend and, you know, your business associate, you know, the person who, you know, you, 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 you know, really kind of set yourself up to sort of walk into the future a long way with. Um, and then all of a sudden it just, everything changes so abruptly. So there's this, there's a shock, right? And then, um, you know, there's this incredible feeling of loss. Um, but while you have that, you don't necessarily have the luxury of being able to mourn the way you might when things were normal because things were so extreme and it was compounded. Um, and you, you know, you're in a, in a place where, you know, you're vulnerable. Um, you know, you really got to kind of dig down deep and remember what it was that brought you into, you know, the, the whole profession to begin with, which is, you love to create. And, um, the first six to eight months, I think after the tragedy, um, was, was just damage control and, um, and being able to try to sustain, um, some of the, you know, client projects that we were working on. Um, and there were some clients though, that were, you know, too early on in their process that were able to really continue to work with whatever staff was there, meaning the vision hadn't really been fully cast. And so one of the saving graces was you, um, you, you end up working with new teams and new creative blood. And because the clients are looking to find, you know, fresh, 
you know, fresh ideas again. So their interior designer that's trusted is now gone. Um, so what do they do? They go out and they find, you know, try to find someone who's going to be able to replace them. So they were, they were drawing out of the Chicago marketplace. And so there were some individuals like Frank Ponterio and Cara Mann and some others that were in that marketplace that, um, you know, were really great creative forces, different than what I was used to, but yet really great and, and saw, you know, a real value in what I was bringing as far as vision to the table and what my team was being able to basically follow up with on service. And so we started tapping into their client list and their referrals as well. So, you know, part of, part of the, the grieving process for me um, was, was also, you know, this door that, you know, you know, when the door closes, the window opens, well, you know, the window opened and all of a sudden, you know, this, this fresh creative energy started coming in and that creative energy is something that I really draw upon and, and it inspires me. So I became very inspired by, you know, building relationships with new people that were depending on me to fulfill my role. And so that was really, a um, it was really, a I think, uh, um, a, a kind of gift in, in the fact that, you know, there, there's this little blessing that comes, you know, in, in the, in the wake of a tragedy like that. And that was one of them, you know, that it, it, it allowed me to find some new creative, you know, muses to work with, which was great. What would you tell yourself if you had to go back and, and talk to yourself during those dark days? Um, you know, uh, don't panic. Um, and, um, and, and don't think that, you know, your, your value was, was only, um, you know, seen through the eyes of this other, you know, of this one individual that, you know, you have this other, you have this ability and this creative energy that, you know, other people are inspired by and want to, uh, you know, and, and want to uh, collaborate with. So I think for me, you know, there was this, there was such a feeling of loss because there was this close personal relationship, you know, first cousin, you know, all these things. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, they lived large and they were very, very inspiring. And it was like, you know, the light just got blown out. And so, um, you know, when you're kind of sitting there kind of going, now what, you know, um, you know, am I going to have any real value or was the value just really, cause you know, you all of a sudden your phone stops ringing and all these other things that, you know, are taking place at the same time in the micro in the, in the macro world. Um, that your micro world is, is, you know, sort of, you know, tragically changed. Um, but if I could tell myself anything, it would be, you know, don't give up hope. You have a, a, an appeal that you don't even realize you have. Um, so that was, that was really a great lesson for me to learn, actually. Awesome. Uh, Wade, I'd like to go back during, uh, thanks for sharing that and uh, the, the story behind that. Now, just previous to that, you had mentioned that you were growing basically from a pretty quickly from a staff to six to about a staff of 22. What was the most yeah. difficult and challenging part about growing that quickly and taking on additional staff? Well, you know, first of all, there's the, this, the, this, you know, technology and, and, you know, just the, ability to continue to sort of, you know, add stations, add software, add hardware, um, you know, not only just the physical surroundings of it, but, but being able to, you know, essentially accommodate the infrastructure for so many individuals, um, you know, you, you, you continue to operate as a single proprietor or one that has just a few employees. And the next thing you know, you got 20 faces looking at you for leadership. Um, I, I think one of the challenges for, for, for me was just learning how to delegate, you know, being able to learn that you have to trust and that you've got to give people the opportunities to fail a little bit um, in their growth because you did during your growth. Um, and you need to be able to um, uh, learn how to 
find ways to r- create some repeatable processes so that you do have the ability to, you know, essentially, um, uh, you know, not reinvent the process each time you have a new client that comes in, that there is a way to, you know, essentially streamline some of the business of, of architecture. And so uh, it was a little bit of a struggle for me, but I was very, very fortunate. I had a couple of clients that were really great, successful business leaders. And those individuals took a liking to me. And they also knew that I literally had no business background or management experience. And so we would have breakfast every week. Once a week, we would have a two or three hour breakfast with my little group of advisors. And they would actually, you know, coach me on, on what to do and help me identify individuals that needed to be elevated and given management roles and how to create a management style and how to think of my business beyond just a single proprietor creative, you know, um, you know, business, but to actually create much more of a corporate, um, background and, um, and, and to find some ways to create some repeatable processes. And so, you know, the, the, we began very early having some really fantastic advice um, that I sought from some of the business leaders that I actually had as clients that took an individual liking to me. And so that was very, very helpful. You, I don't know if you could do it without that kind of advice. You bet. And if there's, in addition to the, the management advice about who to elevate, how to grow leaders in the firm, is there anything that stands out to you now, Wade, looking back, that was really critical advice that they gave you about how to move from the role of the sole proprietor managing everything to more of the CEO role, which it seems like you have now? You know, I've always been sort of um, afraid of stratified, you know, structure in the firm. Um, but, you know, the reality is, is that you literally can't have 22 people or 21 people you know, that, you know, are, are coming to you. You, you really can't, you know, you, you, you have to be able to essentially have a relationship with people that have the ability to have, you know, it's kind of broken down into groups where, you know, there is a chain of command and some hierarchy. Um, and that way we, we create some accountability and that's part of the whole regularizing the, the process and creating a repeatable process is that you do need to be able to, you know, have methods of recovery when someone is sick or on vacation or something. You have to be able to, you know, cover one another. And and, and in covering all those, what are what are the office standards? And and you know, you have to, you know, break down and give people tasks in in the subcommittee type role of, of being able to create um, you know, office standards and drawing standards and drafting standards and, you know, really, you know, reflect this ability to be able to not only onboard somebody in an efficient manner, um, but also be able to cover one another, especially if there's a, a, a personnel change. So, you know, having all that structure in place was really great when we started downsizing because although we didn't have individuals taking on certain roles, we had positions and those positions that were established that no matter what the name was that was coming into place of that responsibility, um, the the responsibilities were were clearly laid out. And so I think what was really great for us is that the individuals that did stay that were versatile enough, um, you know, did find themselves growing in value, uh, you know, in, in, in our sort of, sort of corporate structure because they were able to be so versed across, you know, so many different departments, so to speak. Um, because when you downsize and you go to five or six people, you know, everybody's doing everything at that point, right? You know, so you, you don't just have an IT guy. You got a drafts person who happens to be really good at computers who's growing in IT. And so it's really kind of excellent to sort of see these people, you know, uh, take on those different, you know, hats and roles and responsibilities during the downturn, um, which, which is which is really great, you know, because that that allows all of us to cr- cross pollinate a little easier. Wade, you currently have five offices, and what is your management structure for these individual offices in terms of 
Do you have studio managers there, middle managers? How is the organization currently set up to function? Well, the way we have it, so we have uh, sort of the main principal, which is myself. And, you know, I right now still own 100% of the business, but I'm um, I'm looking for, you know, I've been in the, in the process of working with a um, consultant on a succession plan. Um, w- w- the way we have our office sort of, you know, sort of divided out is we have a, what we call a management team that I work with very closely, senior management team. Um, there are, um, you know, a, a, a essentially, you know, a staffing specialist. Um, you know, our bookkeeper controller is, is, is part of that team. Um, we have three um, senior design uh, coordinators involved in that as well. Um, and then a, um, a, a business st- strategist that is also part of that. And then there's a couple of administrative people that are there to help, you know, sort of, uh, you know, keep things kind of moving along. But um, we've, way we kind of work on it is a senior project coordinator is involved in, in every single project. And the idea is that it's more of a principal level person who's kind of working with project managers. Um, and they can help shift teams of people around based on what the, uh, what the, what the requirements are going to be as far as deadlines are concerned and things like that. And then, I also have kind of a group of what I call sort of free design radicals in the office. And they are sort of the presentation renderer design sort of, you know, oriented people that work with the, um, the senior project coordinator, myself as the principal and the project manager in being able to um, essentially you know, come up with the conceptual designs, the presentations that allow the designs to process and move forward. Um, and then you can add on your technical staff as you need to. So drafts people and, you know, the handling of the consultants and things like that sort of come on. With the five offices, the way the, the, the main work is mostly done in our main studio in, in Wisconsin. Um, so that's our largest studio. That's where our largest workforce is. And that's where the majority of technical drawings are really generated. Um, and those individuals then overseeing those work with the, with the project managers. And the project managers are also scattered among the five offices. So those project managers, um, there usually is one senior project manager in, the, in, in that mix that, you know, is kind of the office, uh, uh, you know, sort of lead office person. Um, but those are really field and marketing offices to maintain relationships locally who will work with the local contractors who are generating the field reports and the on-site supervision. Um, and, and then also meeting with other individuals that are coming forward in those marketplaces, you know, to, to essentially, you know, uh, interview us for possible commissions. So I'm myself and the senior project coordinators are really sort of scattered among all the offices, not just one location. So it's a team of us on the management side that kind of, you know, oversee all the offices. Um, And then there are individual project managers and the people that work in those offices that are maintaining the local relationships um, and doing the, the field observation. Wade, in in terms of the job roles that you mentioned, the positions you did mention, executive business strategist. What is the the value or the role that this person actually plays in terms of uh, the business and the management team? Well, she, she is a very uniquely qualified individual um, who really kind of understands the business of architecture and the need to um, be versatile in our approach to servicing individual clients. Um, so her role really is, is, is to be able to sort of, you know, keep an eye on big picture while coming up to proposals for expanding in, a, in particular marketplaces. So the, the, there's a varied sort of level of, 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 of um, tasks that this individual sort of takes on, which is advising the management team 
being able to look big picture at, you know, the sort of marketing opportunities, the PR opportunities, the doors that are being open and how to essentially massage, you know, the individuals that are working on specific projects into becoming cross marketers for us. So she's very, very well qualified at, at, you know, essentially number one, being able to tailor Uh, a proposal for a client specific project in a specific marketplace with a big, with a, with, with her eye also on the big picture of, you know, who is this individual? How do they play a role in this marketplace that we're trying to expand into or that we are either established in, um, or it's a new marketplace that could be something completely different. So like, for instance, we put together a proposal for a project that we're doing uh, outside of Charleston. Charleston is a growing market. Charleston has incredible architectural heritage. And we feel as if our firm is uniquely qualified to work in a place like that. So working on this project, there are certain things that we are trying to establish, you know, with the project's goals. Um, and the relationships that we're building strategically with the other teammates, the contractor, et cetera, et cetera. So we are looking for ways to be able to collaborate with them on maybe finding a, a new op- a next opportunity, but also on how can we help them market themselves as well. And so that's where she is really uniquely qualified, is we believe in collaboration. And so the collaboration with the teams um, – and the individuals that we're working with in each of these marketplaces are really great vehicles for expanding our business. And we have found that to be one of the best ways to generate new business for ourselves. Gotcha. So those existing relationships, fostering those, adding value, and in return, helping them see you as a strategic partner. Absolutely. And that, that to me is the best way to grow a business. Um, and, and it's worked in, in, in almost every marketplace that we've, you know, for instance, I'm working with a client right now that is just an absolute dream client for, uh, um, was a referral as a, as a lifelong client for an interior designer and very well established in Southern California. And I got to sit on a panel discussion with him about a year and a half ago. And in that panel discussion, there was, you know, some lively topics, and there was some really good exchange of, you know, discussion, you know, amongst us in the panel. Well, after that, he said, I love what you had to say about this. I love what you had to say about that. And he went back and went online and found my website and did his own little research on it. And, and then came back to us and said, oh, my God, I love your website. I love what you're doing. I love the interview with you. That, that, was, that video was fantastic. You know, who did that for you? Who was your production team? And I you know, helped him out. And I said, well, here's my production people. And this is the marketing people. And this is, this was my um, branding agent out of Chicago was a client that I ended up exchanging services with. And, and all of a sudden, the next thing you know, he, he followed up on it and said, you know, I want my firm to mature and go in the same direction. And I was so impressed. I want to do that. Well, lo and behold, it also led to, hey, I, I have this lifelong client that's interested in doing another project, just bought a piece of property next door, You know, and all of a sudden, the next thing you know, we got, you know, put into a pool of interviews with three different architects and ended up prevailing and becoming, you know, the chosen, you know, uh, uh, chosen firm. So, but, but, but these kinds of relationships, you know, with other practitioners that you're working with, um, you know, can kind of grow as to significant opportunities just because, you know, they get a chance to connect with you personally. On, on, you know, just, you know, what do you feel about your business and, and what do you feel about, you know, the opportunities that you're seeing here and how do you feel about the climate in Southern California as far as being a design engine and, 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 you know, and, and all of a sudden the next thing you know, we ended up in this really great dialogue that grew into a relationship that, you know, has harvested some, you know, some wonderful opportunities. So th- those are those are the kinds of ways that, you know, that we essentially try to grow the business is make these other collaborators look really good. Make them look amazing to people. Like they look like a hero to the client because the client seems to be very, very happy with the services that we're providing. Um, and so the, that's really like, in my opinion, that, that, that is really the sort of grassroots way that you kind of build trust and, 
um, and 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 therefore, um, you know, a a a, a backlog, um, which 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 wouldn't have come any other way. Wade, your firm is currently working on a boutique hotel project. Is that right? Yes, in yeah. Nashville. Sure. And what was the key of jumping from residential work? I don't know if, if that's all you've done in the past to add, jumping into another project type. Well, uh, honestly, it kind of goes back to you know my 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 graduate work um, at at U of Penn, where um, I really began to think that, you know, architecture was inspired by a larger context and understanding of a larger context. And so my master's thesis was really a huge urban design vision casting project so that I could deal with much bigger context issues. And so, you know, I did basically a large sort of vision cast master plan project that was really a huge urban project. Um, and so I've always had a personal passion for projects that, um, you know, we're able to sort of relate to a larger context. Um, and so we've always been doing commercial work alongside our residential work. Um, we've always done a lot of restaurants and clubs and taverns and, um, you know, helped with renovating, um, um, you know, uh, an old resort. Um, and, and turning it into a really special destination place. Um, and so, uh, you know, I've had a very, very strong interest in hospitality for a long time. And so this opportunity came up um, and we just happened to be at the right time in the right place. And we how did it come up? Wait, if I may ask. So, well, <laughs> the, 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 the fact was, is that my, my younger brother, um, has always been dreaming about wanting to develop a hotel project. And so it just so happened that I was in Nashville one weekend and he called me up and said, Hey, I'm going to take you to breakfast. And, and so we went to, we went to Waffle House of all places. And, and I'm, I'm like, you know, you know, what, 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 what are we doing here? And, and he said, well, I think I found a site for my hotel, but it has some challenges because it's on steep topography. And I was like, oh, where is it? And he's like, look over my shoulder. Well, across the street was this incredible limestone hilltop um, that was vacant and um, had a development plan for a commercial office space on it. But they were looking to have a three and a half acre hotel site sort of chipped off of it. And um, he just happened to be, like I said, at the right time in the right place. Well, did a presentation for this hotel and, um, and, and the vision casting for it. And I invited the owner of the property to participate in, a pre- in this presentation, which I did as a big family supper at my house. So I had this big hospitality evening, this big family dinner you know, hired a bartender, hired servers, you know, did this really, you know, remarkable meal and basically said, look, if this is going to happen, we all have to work together and collaborate. Well, after the dinner, the owner came up to me and said, you know, I'm blown away. I can't imagine what you might come up with if you had 20 acres to work with instead of three. And I said, well, my understanding is, is that you already have a developer. And he said, well, but nothing's really done. Nothing's in concrete and they haven't purchased the property. All they have is an option. So I'd like to see what you could come up with for 20 acres. And so I did a master plan vision cast for this 20 acre parcel for a wellness retreat, um, small boutique music venue, um, hotel, um, club, uh, condominium homes and, um, and residences that essentially created a, you know, a wellness uh, hospitality community on top of this hilltop at Nashville. And so that's that that first presentation that we did after that, um, you know, led to this opportunity to do a master plan for the whole thing. And um, and the next thing you know, we had invited the local politicians to participate in the presentation. And they were blown away, said, this is iconic. This is what we want in our district. This is what we want on that particular piece of property because it's so prominent. And so it's just built momentum from there. Excellent. 
And Wade, as as a leader right now, as a businessman, as a professional, where do you find yourself stretching and growing? Well, um, you know, I right now we um, we we had tried a couple of other we had some other marketplaces that you know we had been considering um, expanding into, and what I've realized is that the most effective way to sort of expand our brand is really very personal. It's very hands-on, very, you know, face-to-face kind of thing. Um, And so, therefore, what I have kind of been looking at doing is to say either we are going to, you know, break apart some of these areas and, you know, have some of the senior project coordinators take on more of a, a marketing role in those locations because, I found myself just getting exhausted trying to maintain and build new relationships in five different markets. It's just really difficult. So I have a team now in Pittsburgh that is kind of handling that area. Um, I'm kind of working mostly between Southern California and, and, and Tennessee. Um, and my team that's established in Wisconsin, you know, seems to be continue to build new and new relationships and fresh op- opportunities in that marketplace. Um, so we're the way I've been kind of looking at it is again, this is like when I first started expanding, learning how to delegate, learning how to be able to trust and let other people come up with their own management style um, and support that and back them um, with whatever advice I can give them um, and to give them resources so that they are not like I had with myself, having met those business leaders in, 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 in my sort of arsenal um, I, I also need to continue to do that for, for the other leaders in the firm so that, you know, we can sort of essentially create much more of a unified front rather than, you know, really one namesake. Got it. And Wade, just to finish up here, what are you excited about? What's happening in the future? Where are you headed? Well, um, I would really love to see this brand, the Brian Paul um a brand that is this new hotel in Nashville. I would love to see this, this, this opportunity really, you know, take root. And it looks like, you know, breaking ground will happen sometime uh, next year in 20. Um, and then hopefully completion in late 22 or early 23. Um, but I'd love to see that brand take off a little bit. Um, the idea is that they would want to do maybe four to six, of these, you know, type of, you know, community under this brand. Um, and so now there's a, there's a new hotel partner that's come into play. That's a big name in Southern California oriented. Um, and, and they are a, a, a really great sort of fresh, you know, blood into this. So um, I would love to see our firm continue to grow. Um, not only it's, it's custom residential practice, but maybe also a uh, hospitality practice group as well. Excellent. Sounds exciting. Well, we wish you much continued success, Wade, and thanks for joining us today on the Business of Architecture. Well, thank you so much for uh, you know letting us uh, share uh, our background and experience. And that's a wrap. If you haven't already, make sure you get access to my free video course that reveals the roadmap to building a practice that is dependable, rewarding, delivers an exceptional experience for you, your staff, and clients, is autonomous, meaning that it can run without your constant input, and last but not least, has a powerful mission and purpose. Go to dreampracticewebinar.com to access this free video course. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.